everyone. Liz and I are here today, and we're really glad that you're all going to be joining us. We're going to be teaching our Dry Brushing 202 class, which is basically all about the ABCs of ABCs of dry brushing. And um, we're really glad that you are all going to be joining us. And we want to give you a few minutes to get here. And so I'm going to check and make sure that everybody's on their way and that this is posting just fine. Okay, I can see we're on and we're live. So what I, want, what, I, what I wanted to let you know is that if you have any questions for us, uh, because since we're both teaching, we will be taking turns looking at the questions and we'll be able to, when I'm teaching, Liz is going to come in and let me know if you have any questions and then vice versa. So if you've had problems with dry brushing, and I suspect some of you have, um, then what I want you to do is type in what you've struggled with. You know, what are your frustrations with this technique? Where do you run into problem? And maybe we can address those problems during this class. But what we wanted to do first of all is explain that the reason we decided to do this together is we have different techniques and we feel as though the two of us combined will really help you learn learn that much more about dry brushing because we approach it differently. Now, in doing that, we may end up um, making you a little bit confused and that's not our goal here, even though I tend to be really good at that. So if you are going, if, if you have questions or if you're a little bit confused because I do something one way and Liz does something the other way, recognize that Whenever you're doing any kind of a technique, there's more than one way to do it. And so that's what we're here to, to show you today is to show you as much as possible. So we kind of wanted to start with the definition of dry brushing. And Liz, would you like to explain what dry brushing is? Well, dry brushing has a variety of, of ways that it could be used. And to me, the definition is that I'm not using any water in my brush or that it has just very little uh, residue left into the brush. So what else would you add to that, Debbie? Well, I think that's perfect. And would you like to explain what type of brushes you're gonna be using today? I'm going to be uh, using my filbert brush and um, most of the dry brushing I do, I will use this. I like that it doesn't have any corners on it so I can give a really soft application with it. I could use it flat or I could use the chisel edge so it can be sharp or it can be um, uh, wide. Okay, and then what I'm going to do then is I'm going to spotlight myself because I think everybody's starting to find us a little bit. Um, I know some of you used to take classes from me and you know that I originally started dry brushing with um, stencil, stencil brushes that were cut. So I just took a stencil brush and then I snipped it so that it became more of a dome shape like this. And then eventually I had these were wonderful brushes that I had created, um, so the brush created for me and they were the cold dry brush. And then during the recession, um, I had been um, licensing my art. So they um, got rid of these brushes, but the good news is I'm trying to bring them back just for those of you who have been looking for the cold dry brushing brushes, we're gonna be trying to bring them back. But right now, the brush that I am using is the Mons Around. This is a little bit softer hair. And the difference is on this one, this is a hog hair. This one is a synthetic mongoose hair. This one is much softer. I love this for many reasons, and you can blend with this even better than this. But for dry brushing, this is the workhorse, and I absolutely love this. So I'm gonna get started and I'm going to talk a little bit about 
what the dry brushing is and what it isn't. And let me spotlight my video. Okay, I'm already spotlighted. Um, and I'm going to switch over to dry brushing. This is the workforce, and I absolutely love it. There we go. I'm going to show you up close what we're doing. And I want to say that all of you are familiar with dry brushing because you do stenciling. And if you have trouble with dry brushing, you might have trouble with stenciling. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we load our brush. And I'm going to use a stencil brush to begin with. As As, um, as Liz said, what we do is we don't use any water in our brush. So what I always like to do is have dry paper towel. So if you're going to be doing a combination of dry brushing and floating, one of the problems that you might have is you might be picking up water from your paper towel. So always, always, always have dry paper towel nearby. And then what I always do is I load my paint from the center of the puddle. When we're floating or side loading, we come off from the side of the puzzle, pu a puddle. What I like to do is go into the center and I really work it into the brush. And then what I do is I come back over here and I swirl my brush and what I'm doing now is I'm coming off to the side and I'm looking for just a residue of paint. So I have a dry brush, I've really put the paint in and now I've taken it out and you can see there's a little bit of gradation there. So you can see I have very little paint in my brush. So then when I come and I set it down, I'm gonna use a very soft touch. And you can see that this would be fine for making nice rosy cheeks or filling in a stencil. But even when you're using a stencil brush, you can get gradation. And what I do at the end when I'm trying to get gradation is I lighten my pressure. So there's some keys that I've already talked about. How you load your brush is key. You have to only have a residue of paint then as you're brushing, you're doing the dry brush method, you're going to use a very light pressure, especially at the end, when you want it to go from more opaque to semi-transparent. So now let me show you, using a stencil, and I don't even have to reload my brush because I have just a small amount of paint in my brush. I do not have to worry about it bleeding underneath. And this is where, I'm showing you this because this is where dry brushing got its origins. So you can see how clean and all of those edges are. Nothing bled underneath. And it's because I had only a residue of paint on my brush. Okay, so now, Let's go on and actually talk about how I use dry brushing. So for instance, why do I use dry brushing? Well, when I decided to start painting realistically years ago, I realized that doing the more difficult floats um, was very difficult for my students and that a difficult float would be walking out a float, uh, doing a back-to-back -back float, doing triangular shaped floats, uh, or they're called tornado floats. And so obviously within this flower, look at all the different shapes of highlights here. My goodness, this one actually formed a U shape right here, over here. And it, whenever you come away from an edge, that's where things get challenging. When you make your shading or highlighting wide, it, it grows, or when you make it a shape or you come away from an edge, that's where things get a little bit more difficult, and that's when I use dry brushing. So here, I started out with a dry brush, and I came in all along here. 
So um, almost all of these highlights in here were all dry brushed, which made making this very realistic rose much easier. And so an intermediate student could easily paint this rose um, where if you were using just floats, you would have to be an advanced painter. So these are very small, very tight areas um, that as examples of why you would have to use dry brushing. Another reason is when you get to be really large, like I'm going to be teaching this um, coming up in a couple of weeks. This is my Christmas bells. So as I created the highlights to the ribbon and the highlights on the bell, but also the shades on the bell and the shades in here. To walk this whole area out would have been so difficult to do for so many of my students. But now because we're going to dry brush it, they're gonna be able to accomplish this. So what you need to remember, there's a difference between a technique and an application of a value. We're using the dry brushing technique to create an area of value within a design. If you're painting whimsically, even cheeks, you want to make sure that you've got your color placed in the proper area where when you're painting realistically, it's even more important that you don't just hug an edge and that your shades have to come out very wide along with your highlights. So you can see this bell would be almost impossible to paint for anybody who could not walk out a, a float. So by combining dry brushing and floating, you can uh, create these more realistic designs. So now when I come in and I am going to be using my um, Mons and Rounds to show you how I do it. This brush also I do load from the middle of the puddle. And I, you saw that I was really pushing it in. And I think maybe some people do not load their brushes properly. Because if you just put a little bit in and you don't push it in, when you come to take it out, you're gonna completely remove it. There's gonna be nothing there. And you're either going to scrub too hard or you're gonna dig holes because you don't have enough paint in your brush. And so this is where balance comes in. So I'm gonna really push it in my brush and then I'm gonna come over and I'm rotating my brush, so I'm removing the paint evenly. And I'm looking for a residue of paint. I'm gonna do that again. When I load my brush, I come into the middle, I really push it in. So when I'm dry brushing, I don't use a wet palette. I am simply using my wax, pa wax paper palette. Then I really push the paint into the brush. And I come over here, and I'm looking for a residue of paint. And I make sure that I have completely dry paper towel. If I've been floating, I get a new paper towel every time. Then because my brush is in the shape of a dome, I do not hold my brush up like this because it will ruin, ruin the brush, it would cause it to splay out. A lot of people prefer that position, but I actually lay my brush back like as if I'm holding a pencil. Then I come in and I use ever so light of a pressure. You want to barely touch your surface. And I'm using a nice, slow, circular motion. And so now if I'm ending this to say this is a highlight, I'm really lifting my pressure up using ever so light of a touch. And with that, we have a lovely um, highlight with some gradation to it. Now let's say that we have some irregular edges. And yes, Liz. 
There's a question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Patricia is asking, could you float the large area on the bells and then dry brush to walk it out? Okay, so what I do, Patricia, is I dry brush it first and then I float over it. Because when I put in the application of shade first, then when I come over and I float over it, it looks like I'm the best floater in the world. Because a lot of times when you're floating, you'll get streaks and other things. But because I've already dry brushed, it will automatically just look um, more filled in and more smooth and even. So I always begin with a dry brush and then come in and if I'm combining floating, I then come in um, afterwards with a float. Debbie, I hope that answered your question. Debbie, also uh, say again what brush you're using. Okay, right now I have um, a Monza round in my hand. Um, the brush guys carry these and I have a creative blending set. And um, I believe there's a set of five and I think they retail for um, like around $39. Okay, so now I've reloaded my brush. And so let's say I want to go along an edge and this is why it's really good to keep your hand back and why I use a dome brush. By scooting the brush back and forth like this, this is the outside edge. And yes, I would normally have a shade in here, but let's say this is the bell. I'll go into a bell shape. Then what I'll do is I'll come over and I'll use my circular motion on over this. And I tend to go fairly quickly. Your speed would probably be more like this. And it depends on how wide you want to come out. What I really like about this is there's a little bit of variation in value. And remember, we're trying to create value within a form. We're not trying to create a dry brush or a float. So what we want is we want whatever value we're putting in there, the color and the um, particular tone, it's, it's a value. We want that to look smooth and even, like it's either in a shade or in a highlight. So this one, I would repeat it. And what's really nice is in the time that I can reload it, generally, it is um, dry and I can come in with a second application. And this is why I said I'd come in then after this with a float, and, but I would really make sure that it's dry on the way. How much pressure are you using, Debbie? Thank you for asking that question. I'm using a very light pressure. What I tell my students to do, let me reload my brush, is I tell you to first start and make it where it, it doesn't show at all. So I'm barely touching now. And then start adding more pressure. If you just practice that, you will get it. If you come in really hard like that, it's gonna be really harsh and chances are you're gonna dig a hole in it. So I will tell you that if you do dig a hole that there's a ways of getting uh, going around it. Like here, I've got just a little bit more on the outside, it looks a little bit dark in there. I can reload my brush as if to dry brush. And what I can do is just come in and tap. So dry brushing is wonderful then for creating, um, correcting problems too. But you can see how I, that's just a little bit brighter in the center now. So the amount of pressure is you barely touch down, then you start adding more pressure so that you can see it. And then you've got the perfect pressure. I start adding pressure as the paint diminishes, but you have to be very, very careful because the reason you need to be careful is if you're constantly pressing hard, 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 you'll notice that the surface gets shiny. Now, a lot of you have done this, I know you have, 
And can, I don't know if you can see how shiny that is. That's called burnishing it. And um, it's then very hard to come back in and get any paint to stick to it. So then you're gonna have to do that tapping motion that I just showed you. And then you can start dry brushing over it. So with dry brushing, there's many ways to correct problems. But I suspect if any of you are having trouble, it could be how you load the brush, your brush position, and how much pressure you're using. Those really are the keys in everything you do. So then again, now, let me see what time it is. I'm gonna leave enough time for... Okay, we're doing good. I wanna talk about this little pumpkin here. So when you're doing a big item like this, um, obviously it's got smaller segments. What I do is I break it into um, sections where I are different steps. So I create form first and then I worry about the individual segments later. But let me show you then how I'll come in with a highlight in here. Let me put out my colors. I just need a lighter orange. So I know some of you have seen the value scale I created for red. Orange is very similar to um, red where I go through the value scale too. So I'm gonna come in, if I have orange here, I'm either gonna come in with a lighter orange or, or a yellow orange in order to highlight. Okay, let me get a nice fresh brush and a bigger one. So again, I want to load my brush from the center of the puddle. Let me fold this over. And then I really wanna push the paint into the brush. Now, there's one wonderful thing that just took place here. I can see that I did not shake the bottle of paint very well. And you know how when your bottle has a little bit too much of that clear stuff in it? When you get that, it's worse than water. So I'm going to reshake this and put it out because I just noticed how transparent it looked and how thin it looked. That's much better. Okay, so let's try this now. That's much better. So I really want to push it into the brush. Then I'm gonna come in. You can see I've got a lot of paint in there. See how much paint I've got in that brush? Debbie, how much did you dry your brush before you started? Picking My brush up? was completely dry. Mm -hmm. And I just switched into a different brush when I went into orange. So I wouldn't have to worry about washing and then drying my brush. You can towel dry your brush in between colors, but you have to make sure you get most of that moisture out. Because if you have water in your brush, you may not be happy with the end result of um, your dry brushing technique. So what I'm doing now is I'm removing the paint. You're gonna be able to see this a lot better because it's a color instead of that light gray I was using. And you see, I'm, I'm really going back on the edge of my handle, making sure that I am getting any full strength paint out. But can you see the difference in color right there? That's full strength and this is semi-transparent. It's very important. Okay, so I'm gonna put my brush where I want the lightest and brightest and I'm gonna say, I have an upper right hand light source. So I'm gonna come down and again, I dry brush very fast because I've been doing this for 26 years. Your speed will be a little bit slower. But then I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna go all around the outside edges. So we have to take into consideration the shape of the form, the icon that we're painting. In this case, we're painting a pumpkin. So, but I'm highlighting this in individual um, segment of the pumpkin. 
So we have to make sure that it takes on the shape of whatever we're painting. I'm not gonna bring it too low because as this bows out, this is gonna be shaded down here. And I wanna make sure I just allow this to just fade away. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the next panel. And then I'm gonna show you how I'll reinforce that in just a few seconds after I put one in. People are um, asking again about which brush you're using, but I think what we could do is, is at the end in the comments, we can just comment about the brushes that we're using. Absolutely. We've got a question from Jana and she says, so you base coat, then add highlights, then float a project versus adding highlights at the end. That's a question. Okay, say the question again, please. Okay, she's asking if you base coat, then add the highlights, then, a, then float, or rather than adding the highlights at the end, I think the answer is that you could do either. Exactly, and that's what I was just gonna say. Um, right now, um, I'm just demonstrating, and so I'm not putting in the shades. I'm just showing you how I would like. So I'll start with the Sometimes it's, I'll start with the shades. As a matter of fact, when I taught this rose, we did the shades first because I wanted to make sure we had our nice deep darks in before we came in because this rose could have gotten too light too quickly and or too dark too quickly. So I wanted to make sure we kept it balanced. So we started with our shades and then we came in. And what I do is I paint in stages. So since this has, when you're painting real, realistically, you need at least five values to create form. This probably had nine values by the time we were done. And value is how light or dark a, a particular color is. So then what I do, what I do is I paint in stages. So we did all the first shades first, and then I did all the highlights. So as I'm teaching, I, de I decide where our students might have trouble, and then that might help me decide what I will start with. But a lot, what's really important is where you place your highlights and where you place your shades. It doesn't matter which one you start with. So I hope that answered that good. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna show you now, because this is a little bit uneven in the inside. I'm gonna show you then how, when I go back and reinforce it, how nice and smooth and even it is. So I'm going to purposely create a mistake here. I've got a few more minutes here. So I'm gonna purposely come over here and make that way too bright. Can you see how bright that is there? I'm gonna show you how to fix that. So I know that I base coated this with warm, warm sunset and or it's the value next to it. So what I can do is I've loaded a little bit of warm sunset in here, which was the base coat color. And then see what happens when I go over it. See how I can correct the problem there. So now I'm creating a nice highlight with gradation again, and it's not too bright on that side. So if you were to come in too light or too heavy with too much pressure, a lot of time, whatever color is next to it, you can come in and very gently go on the outside edges to fix it. Matter of fact, I might do that over here too. Because essentially, essentially what I'm doing then, since dry brushing, you're really applying a uh, fairly semi-transparent application of color. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a whole nother color between these two. So 
So what I do then, my whole premise of dry brushing is I'm creating three-dimensional form. I don't want to create texture. Um, and that's why uh, in the beginning, when I started dry brushing to create three-dimensional form, I did not use fabric brushes. And so many people at that time were using fabric brushes to dry brush little uh, rosy cheeks. So the type of brush you use is very important. Um, and I like the dome shape again, because I can go right up to an edge. And like, so I could come in and I don't have, let me see, I've got some brown here. Let me make a darker orange really quick. Debbie? Yes. Uh, Christina wants to know if the rose pattern is available. No, I will probably teach that again in the spring. I'm going to leave that in my uh, mm -hmm. teaching portfolio. But Debbie has lots of wonderful patterns on her website. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I have to stick a commercial in there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And, and sometimes there are some things I believe in my teaching portfolio because I really believe they need to be taught. And that's why sometimes I also will create a video for a particular design because I think you need the visual instruction from me. A lot of times people don't want to buy a video because they think that I have great pattern packets and I appreciate that. But there are reasons and I do put thought into things. Um, when I am um, deciding whether I'm going to just do an EPAC or whether it's going to have a video. So what I want to show you is I want to show you how I can come up. And I hope I made a dark enough color. And I don't know that this is going to show. I'm over here mixing colors, girls. This would be driving you crazy. Okay, let me put some more brown in. I'll just use brown. That will show really good. So anyway, what I'm doing is going back and forth. See how you can go right up to that edge. And that's because I'm using a dome brush. Now I've got burnt umber in my brush, but because I'm using such a light touch, see how it lays down so easily. If I were to come in with too much paint, and let me do that on the next side, now look what happens over here. That's way too much paint, that's way too harsh. But remember what I said? You can always go back into your background color. That was full strength paint. And sometimes we forget to load our brushes properly. But if I take my background color I can go in, and this might take a couple applications, but I can push it back and correct the problem. So now what we're going to do is we're going to I'll let Liz take over, and you're going to have to give us a few seconds so we can switch our cameras. I have to unspotlight myself. And then I'm going to switch over to Liz, I'm going to need for you to unmute your and open your video. And then I'm going to mute this one. Okay. And then let me spotlight. Okay, can you turn on your video for um, your demonstration? There you go. Now I'm gonna spotlight that, there we go. Okay, so now Liz is going to take over and she's going to explain to you how she approaches dry brushing. Okay, let 
me just, one thing that I think you'll get from uh, Debbie and myself is that there's not just one way to dry brush. Um, just remember what Debbie said, and I said to start with, is that we're not really carrying water in our brushes. <clears throat> so, let me get myself set up here. I'm going to be using a filbert. And when I'm doing my dry brushing, I don't really need to go buy a new brush or use my best filbert brush because a lot of times I'm creating texture with my brush. I wanted to show you, I just taught this class and I'm pretty close here, so you might not be able to see the whole thing. But the pumpkins were entirely um, created with dry brushing. The cat was dry brushing. Now this was on a textured surface and you can see with the dry brushing, I got some really great effects in the background. Okay. So most of this was painted with dry brushing in some form or another. Okay, let me get that out of the way and I'll show you. I like to use dry brushing with fur. So you can see on the fabric here that my brush was really dry. And as I'm moving away from my center of interest, I'm getting drier and drier, okay? So that's really great with the dry brushing because you can be strong and you can be soft and help create your center of interest. This is a cat. Um, this is Fonzie and I've been working on him. He's not quite finished yet, but I'll show you just a little bit of how I use dry brushing with that. So. Let me get my palette up here. And I'm going to work on one of these little black squares. So I'm going to use some red paint. And this happens to be the uh, Deco Art Traditions paints. And I love the reds because they show up on these dark surfaces. So I've got some paint on my palette. I'm going to move that a minute. I'm going to wet my brush. Okay, unlike what Debbie did, I'm going to wet my brush this time. And I'm going to use it a lot with no water. So I want to get the bristles wet up into the ferrule. We get that out of the way. And now I'm going to dry my brush. I'm going to come to my paper towel and I'm going to push and I'm going to lift the handle of my brush up. When you lift your brush, you're telling it you want to fan out. Okay. Debbie was using her brush down low and she was telling it she wanted it to hang together. This time I'm telling it I wanted to fan out and pull some more water out of my ferrule. I just want it damp up there. I don't want to be carrying water into my paint. So you can see where it's still damp there. Let's do it again. It's drying. Get rid of a drop on my ferrule. And I'm pulling some paint out here and working the paint into my brush. Now I'm working on a dry palette. Okay, this is a Gray Matters dry palette and I'm working the paint into my brush. I'll come back to my paper towel, lift it up. Just the act of working that paint into your brush is working the bristles up into the ferrule. So you can see it's pulling more moisture down out of the ferrule. So I'll blot again. There's more moisture coming down. Let's do it one more time. I want it pretty dry. And now I'm going to work a little bit more of that paint 
out of my brush. Now, just like Debbie was saying, we're starting off here. I don't know exactly how much paint I have in my brush or um, how much is going to uh, be applied to my surface, but I can come in and start very softly. And I'm just skimming the surface. Is that, yeah, that's showing up for you. Mm -hmm. It's looking good. Picking up a little bit more paint. I'll show you that here. And if I'm over here and I brush and nothing's happening, it just tells me I'll need a little bit more paint. I don't want to use pressure. That's what Debbie was saying too. We don't want to use pressure. But if I come back and I'm skimming over and we'll walk out just like Debbie did. And it fades away. And I can go back into the brightest area. Usually I'll start in the bright area and work out. Okay, now this is like I'm creating an edge, like if I'm painting um, a fruit or berry, something like that. There are two things that I can do with this dry brushing. If I set my brush down and flick back, sit it, flick back, sit it down perpendicular and flick back, you can see I'm creating an edge. And that may be what you want sometime. But then another time, maybe you don't want to create an edge. And this is what I was doing over here, starting off the surface, lightly skimming the surface and back off the surface. And you can see that this is soft on both edges now. And I could work back and forth. Now I started and made a really hard line there, but I can come back in and softly go outside that line. And this may take a little bit of time to get rid of that line, but I could do a soft dry brush in there. Okay. So, I would use this to uh, create lights and darks. I can get a lighter color and come back. And you can see that it's strengthening that red. Actually with this, not the red light in the traditions, I can just use several applications of this same color Let's see if it's dry and come back in and it just gets more intense. I could come in here. Okay, so now this is one way I could use dry brushing. Another thing that I do is create texture. And I can pull straight with the brush, just like we've been doing. But I can also use the chisel edge. And in this instance, I have a little more paint on my brush. And I can create fur. Now, that was a good bit more paint but I still consider this dry brushing in that I'm not carrying water in my brush. Excuse me, Liz, we have a question from Sandy Peters. Sure. She says, when you are loading, do you take it to the paper towel again? 
if I need to, but once, once I have that first load on my brush, then I have a feel for how my brush is um, carrying the paint. And so I really don't have to take it back to the paper towel unless all of a sudden I just picked up too much paint. Then I'd probably come over and work some off. But if it's entirely too much, I could just drag lightly on my paper towel to get rid of some paint. So as long as I'm not picking up more water, I don't have to blot because I'm just each time picking up just a little bit. Can you see how dry that is? This is why I'm working on a dry palette because I'm not picking up more water. Okay, so with your brush then, do you turn your brush over or do you always use the same side? Good question. When I'm loading, I'll usually come in and turn it over and pull on the other side. Because if you are doing something like this, maybe you have a little bit more paint on your brush, then you may be having that little paint that squishes up around the side or right now can you see the paint, move it over here, that's come this other way, that's squished up around the tip. And if I come back and drag it, then I have my brush um, without any paint squished around the side. And when I'm painting, I'm usually using just one side of my brush. So I've picked up a good little bit of paint on my brush here. So I could do furry strokes. Okay. Look, what I did <clears throat> Excuse me. What I did on the pumpkin that I showed you to start with is I got gradually lighter. And let me put out just a couple colors here. I'm adding vermilion and some um, Hansel um, yellow to my palette here. So if I want to get lighter, I'm just going to wipe my, wipe my brush, okay? If I've worked most of the paint off of it, I might not be uh, wiping much off, but then I'm going to go straight into that lighter color. In this instance, it's vermilion, and I can come back in. Oh, this is good, and added some. Now, picking up more paint, I've got to do this quickly. I, I call this a dump. I kind of dumped paint right there. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer. Can you see where it's globbed on there? Yes. And fingers are great. First thing I would do is rub it real quick. I'm working on mat board, so it's really absorbing the paint, but um, if the uh, finger doesn't get it, don't really worry about it because you can always fix it, especially with the dry brushing. I picked up just a little bit more vermilion and I can just work out from there. Okay, this vermilion is being a little wetter than the now the red light was. Um, so I have to get the feel of it again, but you can see that it's getting brighter there. You can see this is brighter than that sample is. Now I can come in here, a little wipe if I need to. I'm going to pick up some hands of yellow and work it in my brush. One advantage to this is with that dirty brush and picking up the yellow, I now have an intermediate color between the vermilion 
and the Hanseella. You want to make sure this is dry. I dumped before, so I want to make sure that it still doesn't have that moisture in it. And I can come back in. I've got to be careful to start with here because I don't know how damp this is every time I change. And it's pulling up, um, pulling up the brightness. I'm going to wipe my brush again. I'm going to pick up some more Hanseella. Okay, you see I worked off some more of that vermilion and now it's showing more yellow. And I can come back and each time with this, I would get smaller. So we've got one lobe of a pumpkin painted here. Okay. Um, I'm going to see how we're doing with, with time here, Debbie. You're doing good. We still have eight minutes. Okay. I'm going to once you um, get all that paint into your brush, you really need to clean it good. And I'm going to just switch brushes here to save time. And I want to show you a little bit on my cat. So I was using with um, using buttermilk for the muzzle, it looks like. Now, these were traditions paints. This is Americana, and the Americana has more medium in it, so it's a wetter paint. So I have to get the feel of that again. So I've switched down to a number eight filbert. That 10 or 12 would still be a good size, but it's dirty. So here I am. You saw me blot like I started. Then I'm picking up paint and I'm blotting again. This has less bristles in the ferrule, so I don't have to blot it quite as much. Working that paint into my brush. I want to make sure the paint's in the brush, not on the brush. You don't want any gloppy parts there. Now, you can see on the cat's muzzle right here that the color just stops. And you can see in my photograph that it fades away more. So we'll turn this sideways. Okay, we have a question, Liz. Sure. Can you use traditions together with regular acrylics? Or do you generally stick with traditions when you're using them? Well, traditions and Americana, both by Deco Art, are compatible. Um, some of the other brands of paints have different formulations, like you wouldn't use it with Jeff Sonia paint. That's a gouache, it's not um, an acrylic. Um, Folk art is a little different formulation, but I think it would probably work good. And you can see that I used very little pressure and got rid of that line that I had there on um, Fonzie's muzzle. Now, if I pick up a little more paint, I can come in here. One thing about a filbert brush is that it gives you some nice snaggly edges. All of this, you see the fur edge there, was done with a filbert brush. I don't want to do too much because I kind of like what I had. But with that dry brushing, it makes it look furry. And again, this is where I could use the chisel edge rather than being completely flat with this. And if I wanted some tufts. So we have a question. So sure. in general, when you're creating fur, you're using dry brushing to create the texture instead of pulling individual lines. Yes, yes. Oh, that makes it so much easier. I'm loving it. Yes. If 
if I started off with something like a, a rake or a comb brush, it would take me forever to get the fur painted. But with the filbert, I can get the basics in. And I, if you look closely on the face here, let me see, I, there we go. Yeah, you can see some individual lines here where I have started using a rake brush, but look at this over here. You don't see any individual lines. So I'll usually start by dry brushing with my filbert brush and that gets the base um, coat down there and gets me started and then I can just refine. Now, as I come back and refine, I'll go to more detail here in the mask of the face because that's where I want my interest to be. But as far as I'm concerned, this paw is finished. So what we is- We have another question for you, Liz. Sure. Do you texture most of your backgrounds? No, but um, I really, well, let me change that to a definite maybe. <laughs> I don't necessarily use texture products on um, most of my backgrounds, but um, on this one was already textured and I thought, well, that would be really cool if I painted it really dark and put pumpkins on it. It makes it look kind of scary. And I love the texture, uh, the way that worked on the pumpkin there. But the reason that was a maybe let me, okay. So I often don't do flat backgrounds. So I would call this modeling, but would you consider that texture? I mean, it's giving a textured appearance to the background instead of just um, a flat like this. Yes. Um, this piece, I've used um, a texture product. This was the same map board and I came over it with a texture product. And I think that's really fun with the dry brushing. Do I have just another minute? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Back in this area, I've used dry brushing. I like to do that uh, to create um, sunshine or moonshine or um, give some light source coming down. I've got a large flat brush. Here's my three quarter wash. And again, I would blot it. And I'll show you just one more thing. And I'll do this on my little texture card so you can really see it. Um, and I'll use the buttermilk paint. So I'm loading this brush just the same way with just a little bit of paint on there. It's not much. I'm hurrying, so. Don't hurry. We can be a few minutes late, it's fine. Okay. So we'll make sure it's nice and dry. And I can come in. Now, what I want to do is create some direction. Say, this is my light source, whatever it is. And um, I want the light to be catching the texture in this direction. So can you see I'm holding, I've got my, my hand actually on this surface and I'm holding the brush just as flat as I can. And if I, lightly drag it and dry brush over that surface. It's picking up. Okay, I kind of dumped there, so let's rub it. I'm picking up the texture. And one thing I did with um, the the pumpkin design is I used some interference paint. This happens to be the DecoArt Media paint. 
and loaded that. Now this is going to be a little bit um, more liquid, but again, if I'm holding very light and pull down, and it should be catching here, and I'm going to move it around in a minute and see if you can tell what color I was using. And what I love about this more than anything, Liz, is you're showing how important your breast brush position is right now. Because if your hand was not laid back like that, so you could keep the pressure real light, mm -hmm. it would almost be like a base coat. So that's yeah. such a good example. And can you see? That yeah, it, it comes oh. in more opaque then. Yeah. yeah. It puts the, the um, chisel edge of the brush and you can tell, oh, that's a brush stroke rather than coming in here like this and skimming the surface and you don't see any of those chop marks to start with. Can you see the purple? Yes, it's very, very cool. Yeah, and the dry brushing really stands out. It's really standing out on the camera. Um, it's a little bit more subtle. Now, say I got more than I wanted, I could just glaze it or like Debbie was doing, uh, dry brush it down with the base coat color. So did we have any more questions? We don't have any more questions. Oh, someone's asking what ear interference paint is. Do you want to um, explain what interference paint is or just show the bottle again? Yeah, interference paint interferes with the light so that in one direction, um, let's see. Okay, so you don't see it very much that way. But if I turn the surface a little bit, you can see the color show up a lot more. Um, so it, it interferes with the light. So it's not really a shimmer like glitter, but as um, you move around the piece, um, it's gonna catch the light differently. It's lots of fun. It's, it's a fun little project, especially for Halloween or for Christmas, and um, they have all kinds of colors in there. So, um, okay, well, if you are done with your technique, I'm gonna bring us both on together again, and we will turn the spotlight off. There we go, and hopefully we're both spotlighted again. Yes. Um, you know, uh, we've had a lot of people ask about my brushes again and ask about various other brushes. Someone also said the brush guys are out of my brushes. So the brushes that I use are the Silver Monza Short Rounds. And what's really important is the length are short. Um, I will check with Silver Brush and find out what's going on. I'll contact the brush guys first. But I will tell you that I originally told you that um, and I also, I originally created the Debbie Cole um, dry brush years ago, and this really is superb for dry brushing, and I am trying to bring these back. So we will keep you posted on all of these um, and let you know what's going on with those brushes. I think what was really important is that you saw that I use dry brushing to create form. And so therefore the type of brush with the dome um, shape was very important. Keep in mind that you can use any brush you want. However, your brush position, how you load the brush, how you're using the brush is gonna make a difference. So then you saw how Liz was using um, a filbert brush and making some amazing um, textures and, and form with that. And then you saw her use a flat brush on a textured background to emphasize the texture that was already there. So there's so many different aspects to dry brushing. But bottom line is how much paint you're using, whether your brush is wet or dry, um, your brush position, 
and uh, the amount of brush paint in your brush. Do you have anything else in conclusion here, Liz, to yeah. add to this? I was just going to say that Debbie and I have just scratched the surface or dry brushed the surface. Yes. Um, just a better, this is to give you just an idea of how we're, some of the ways we'll say that we use dry brushing. But if you're really wanting to see more of it, you should take one of our video classes where we're doing the techniques and that way you can really um, see more in depth what we're doing with the dry brushing. Okay, and I have a comment from Robin and I have to mention this, thank you, Robin. She says, I have your old brushes, Debbie, and they're the only ones I ever use. I hope so. I so hope you can find a source for them. You know, I'm working on it, Robin, I am. And I agree that if you wanna, you know, like if you can see that very back right there, um, I'm going to have an e-course on that landscape. And so I'm gonna be using dry brushing there in a completely different way. And so I think what you'll find that when you take lessons from both Liz and I, even though we love dry brushing, um, depending on what we're teaching, we'll end up using so many different variations of the technique. And um, perhaps that's where a lot of confusion comes in for, for all of you. But if you remember to really watch the pressure you use and watch your brush position, and um, as you're taking the various classes, if you are not an expert at dry brushing, um, really watch what the teacher's doing during the class. Really watch how she's, if she's not stressing how she's using her brush. I know Liz and I really explain this a lot and really emphasize um, all these things. But, um, and then also go on to YouTube. Oh, I did wanna point out I also have about a 45 minute video just on dry brushing and it gets into creating form with dry brushing and that will reinforce this too or an and or add to it. So I hope this all helps and we thank you all so much for joining us for our live dry brushing 202. And you can look for more because I just love saying live with Liz. <laughs> I think that sounds so cool. So thank you'll be seeing you more from us. And we'll be doing more technique classes and let us know maybe what you might want to learn. So thank you all for joining us. Good night, everyone.